Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance, not in the Crawl Space studios in Wormtown, but being joined remotely through the magic of the internet. What's up, Lance? Yeah, the internet. This new thing, the internet, which is really getting us by um, during yeah. these uh, interesting times that we live in. Uh, I'm doing well. How are you today, Tim? I'm doing good. Uh, I am also thankful for the internet and uh, and the great people uh, still working out there. And uh, obviously, we all know what uh, state the world is at. We don't have to get into it too much. Um, but uh, Lance, this interview is really something. It's uh, with a fellow named Sean Cribben and his friend named Billy Greer. They are working on a documentary. The documentary is called Was I Next? The Sean Cribben Story. And Billy Greer is producing this documentary about Sean's encounter with a serial killer, the fellow named Bruce MacArthur from Toronto, Canada. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Bruce MacArthur was Canada's serial killer from 2010 to 2017, and he preyed primarily on the gay community uh, in Toronto's Gay Village and uh, Cabbage Town, which is another, which is a section of Toronto, sort of an alternative section of Toronto. And Sean Cribben was one of two that survived one of his attacks, which his story is mind blowing on so many levels, from how he uh, first met Bruce MacArthur, the relationship that they had. It was primarily an online relationship. The first day that they met, the crazy first thing that he, he said to Bruce when he met him and and the attack itself and how he survived it, right down to like the survivor's guilt that he had, which is sort of heart-wrenching to hear. It really is, and it's compelling to hear what what someone is going through, someone in uh, the situation that Sean is, uh, someone who uh, really should have been killed by Bruce MacArthur, but Bruce's roommate came home and sort of foiled his plan, and you'll hear why Sean knows that he would have been next um, in the interview. He's got some um, really disturbing details about photographs uh, about himself being posed. So, uh, yeah, it's heart-wrenching and terrifying to hear how Bruce MacArthur groomed Sean for years um, by just being a friend online. And he was unassuming. And we made the connection through uh, Mr. Billy Greer, who has his production company. Uh, This is the first time that Billy has produced a documentary. And their backstory is pretty interesting as well, where Sean had helped Billy out during some hard times and it's come full circle in a sense where Billy is able to do this for Sean now and tell his story. Yeah, it's a really interesting connection and I'm really excited to see the movie. Unfortunately, they're a little bit held up by the coronavirus right now, but I'm sure we will get to see it at some point soon. And you can check out uh, the information on Billy's production company and the status of the documentary at the website icogitate.ca that's i-c-o-g-i-t-a-t-e dot c-a okay enjoy the episode thanks for listening give us five stars Welcome to Crawl Space. We are being joined now by two very special guests. We have Billy Greer and we have Sean Cribben. How are you, fellas? Hi, good. Thanks for having us on. Hi, guys. How you doing? Thanks for coming on. I uh, hope you guys are you know, staying healthy during this pandemic. And uh, it's really fascinating uh, story that you have. And I, I feel like we're pretty fortunate to be able to speak with you about this, Sean. Um, but I want uh, Billy to sort of introduce uh, this, the the topic here because um, you're the one that originally reached out about, uh, you know, Sean's story and, and we got the ball rolling through you. So if you want to take a couple minutes, Billy, and just describe uh, yourself and, and how you got involved in Sean's story and, and who Sean Cribben is. It started about 23 years ago. I had met Sean. I was working uh, at a nightclub downtown as a bartender and friend of mine was Sean's partner at the time and I had known him from my hometown so we had kind of known each other in the scene for a while and um, fast forward maybe a year or two I was running some after hours booze cans in the city and it was a late night affair everything kind of went south for a hot minute and I found myself on the streets for a while I was um, 
almost I lost everything. And basically, the couch I ended up on and the solarium I ended up in was Sean's. And that was kind of life altering for me. He was working, holding down a job, teaching, you know, keeping it going. It was a good example of um, how I could get it back on track. He didn't really know that at the time. Um, you know, when I saw the interviews in the last couple of years where he had been the survivor of the uh, MacArthur's encounter, um, it didn't register. I, I, you know, I had lived with Sean for about eight months to a year in that 97, era 98, um, but it didn't register then. I was watching this and I was so consumed with the story. We all were here. It was on our news. We were inundated and I just really hadn't listened and one day my modem went out and I was forced to just listen to the TV. I was uh, looking out the window waiting for my modem to come back up and I heard the voice and it was Sean's voice. I stepped back from the TV and then it all hit me. realized he was the one that was in the interviews all along and it took me about eight days to get a hold of him because all of his social media was pretty much on lockdown and um, when I got through it was a pretty emotional conversation and I had just said you know, basically the one part in your interview that I had seen was you had said you wished the world knew you before you became this headline and I thought wow I knew you before and what a good guy and what a great story to tell so I begged, borrowed and stole every opportunity I could and jumped through a few hoops to get a chance to tell his story because he was already being pursued and um, when we met and I met with his partner who is also now our musical director and um, you know, the whole team just kind of came together once Sean said Billy about the gig and uh, I pitched the treatment, showed him my angle on the story and how I thought we could kind of put the humanity back into this gruesome picture. And um, we assembled a team, a couple from the Sioux, Tammy Riedel, and uh, is our executive producer, Craig Huckerby is our director. We have uh, Steve Souther as our musical director, that's Sean's partner, and James Nelson is our production assistant, myself, and there was our team, and we hit the ground running last July 26th. There's our story. Wow. Okay, so the movie's coming together. And the, the movie that you speak of is uh, the Sean Cribben story, and Sean Cribben was one of the few survivors, I think there were only two survivors, of the notorious Toronto serial killer, Bruce MacArthur. And Bruce MacArthur was... Uh, active during 2010 to 2017 he targeted primarily gay men that's correct right was it was it exclusively gay men yeah, yeah. yes um or bisexual okay some were married. oh i see and yeah. he has a uh, official uh victim count of eight and he was just apprehended uh like a year and a half ago or something right in january of 2018 so this is this is very recent, and yeah. he is currently in prison. And Sean, you survived. You were one of two people who survived him. Yeah, and at the time when I found out was when I got called into the police office, and um, it was at that time he was only charged with the first two murders because they had not found the remains yet, and so they found some uh, blood and semen in his vehicle, which the police police had been following him so when he tried to get rid of the vehicle he uh they were there to then take it into for evidence once i realized the whole thing because i was just learning of it that day after his arrest i felt a lot of pressure coming out of there because it was just my testimony and um the the blood in the semen there was no bodies so that was um at, just before i left the police station the detective said to me, you have a piece of information for this case that no one else has because the other people who have this information are dead. And I was like, holy fuck. <laughs> that was just like, uh, okay, I think I got into the Uber I had called and I think I very excitedly started rambling on about how I just survived a serial killer. Because that was all new information. I had no clue at, up until that day. That's in, yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I, I have to imagine you're still processing that. I guess if you can take us through um, what happened. So the the morning, um, I got up and uh, we tried to hook up on May first, 
I laid down about noon for a nap and um, I missed the pickup time at, at three o'clock in the afternoon. And that was probably the first time my life was saved because if I had gone that time, he, his roommate would not have come home early and I, things would have been go, gone the way they did. But even then there were signs of premeditation because uh, it didn't register any flags because you're not thinking oh this is a serial killer he was parked like about three or three and a half blocks from my my um where my place is to pick you up and um there is a, a drive where you can pull in but there's also a camera that's pointed directly at whoever pulls into that spot um he was behind an apartment building on a side street that is doesn't have a lot of foot traffic to pick me up the first time. So that was kind of that was all hindsight information. Um, so then on July 26, this time bound and determined not to be late, I was running a little late, and uh, I I said, uh, I'm, but at this time I was texting and saying, okay, I'm on my way. I'm just uh, grabbing this and then coming down. So when I got into his truck, the very first phrase that I brought up was so there's a serial killer in the neighborhood and i start to say uh things like i wonder who it is because i had my own theories i had been throwing around that it was maybe an uber driver or something because they would know the gay neighborhood and they would just pick up the calls from there but um i was wrong <laughs> um and uh the i still to this day i've been able to ask the question of him but I still haven't received the answers yet. So uh, I'm, I'm still waiting on that because the detective uh, later after his, uh, he pled guilty um, allowed me to submit some questions to MacArthur personally. So you, uh, you were connecting with MacArthur. Uh, how did, how did you um, get his initial uh, contact information? Where did that, uh, where did that connection first come from? Okay. So um, he had been sp- speaking to me kind of casually for about um, three three years, maybe a little bit longer, on three different apps, gay men's apps. And uh, there was Barefoot One, One, there was Recon, and there was, uh, what was the other one? Growler. So between those three, like, and they were nothing serious or, or even that overly flirtatious. It was just like, how are you doing? Um, he became like a casual kind of online cyber per- personality for me. And then this one time, um, we said we should, we should meet and it didn't seem like I was meeting, um, a stranger because he kind of, uh, in a way he kind of groomed me by becoming this sort of like very casual person in my periphery. So it didn't seem like, okay even though that was the first day I I met him face to face was the day that he tried to kill me. You were, you were talking with him, uh, messaging him for three years. And you, you think that that might've been the, a way that he would, uh, groom his victims and, and probably was grooming you. Uh, was there any, and I know you said it, it, it was pretty normal as far as the conversations, but was there any sort looking back on it, any sort of red flag that, that might, uh, that you, that you can look at now and say, Oh yeah, that, that was a little off there's he's he's very manipulative and he's very smart i've learned that because of um i was of what i knew from behind the scenes and the case was it was evolving and i wouldn't all all the things he's he's not spoken publicly so i i just have to assume that every move he did was thought out and with intent to maybe groom his little next set of victims and and uh or even possible victims didn't you ask him about something and he went right into his landscaping did you tell me oh that was after i said about the serial killer and then he yeah. uh, changed the topic to um to his work and then uh he also brought up on the way home about being a mall santa which now seems creepy but at the time it was uh Oh, it was uh, the reason I brought it up in the initial interview was because it made him more trusting. Like, who doesn't trust Santa Claus? You're brought up trusting Santa Claus. So I thought, and then I thought, oh, that's sweet. He does community service. Oh my god! 
he was a mall Santa Claus. And um, so w- when you asked him about the serial killer, he just immediately changed the subject? We hadn't pulled away from the curb when I brought up the serial killer. And then it was by the time, it's a very short ride to the corner. And by the time we turned the corner, he was he shut that topic down. It, um, it did come up one other time. I made a comment. I don't know why, but that was later at his place. We'll get to that. Leading up to uh, meeting him, you you uh, knew about a serial killer that was stalking the gay community. Uh, how how long had you known about the serial killer, and what was that like? You know, in that community, was there a lot of talk, or was it just um, did people whisper about it, or or you? No, was, it was, there was a lot it of, was uh, like the talk. Everyone, um, especially after Andrew went missing. Um, because he was very well known and then, um, it was, and all his, uh, his disappearance was very unlike him. So, because he had a cat and he was very, um, there's no way he would leave his cat with, for days without food. Like, um, so there were little things that were so out of character. They, they knew uh, the community pretty well knew something had gone awry. Um, the, the victims prior to to um, to Andrew, there there were two that weren't reported, and then there was also um, they didn't have a lot of ties to the community, and that was on purpose. Like again, he was very smart, and manipulative in picking his victims. Yeah. So um, yeah, like uh, it was hard for the police to do do a job with, um, when there was no evidence. There was nothing. Right. Just, those ones were it's hard to join those dots for sure. Yeah, because they were yeah. reported later than um, Andrews um, was helpful mo- basically because within uh, 24 hours or whatever the minimum or the maximum, the time they have to wait till the person's considered missing, um, he, was, he was reported missing. And I remember it was going around Facebook. Have you seen Andrew? He's he didn't show up. And yeah, we saw the posters on Church Street too. Sean, it was he, he raised the visibility faster than all the other ones. And you're talking you're talking about Andrew Kinsman, who disappeared from the Cabbage Town section of Toronto, uh, June 26, twenty seventeen. That's the that's the Andrew that you're speaking of. Uh, yes. And um, it, there's, uh, if you look at them, it was almost like he was stepping up his game because Celine Aston uh, disappeared in April. Then there was the, um, my arranged uh, meeting May 1st, which I, I failed to appear. Um, and then Andrew went in June and then I went in July and this time I did go. So that's, um, he never had that month after month. Do you think that he was losing control? Um, I, 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 I believe so. It's my opinion that either he wanted to get caught at this point yeah. or he was just um, making some big mistakes because um, Andrew was uh, and myself are high profile um, gays, I guess. Um, we have lots of ties to the community. So uh, we, like I would have been noticed not being home uh, at six o'clock in the evening because I was always home at six o'clock in the evening when my partner came home from work. Yeah. Okay. So you had your first meeting with, um, with him scheduled and you accidentally slept through that and you scheduled the second meeting. He picks you up and you're in his, you, you, you went to his, his vehicle and you ask him, you know, you, you start the conversation about the serial killer. He shuts that down. What happens after that? Um, then we, we talked about his landscaping business, which, um, he was very proud of and, uh, the mall Santa. And there was some moments of awkward silence. Um, but you know, we're just meeting for the first time. That's not unusual. It was, it's five miles from my place to his place. So, um, and it's in a place where you have to take some buses and, and the subway. So, it made sense that he would offer to pick me up because otherwise I probably would have said, I'm not going out there because <laughs> um, I'm lazy. Um, but um, right. when we got there, now, oh, he did bring up the fact that he had a roommate while it was in the car. He he did not. He did not bring up the fact that he had a roommate. No, he did. He did. Um, so oh, he did. I, I okay. He, I don't know uh, if he did that in case the roommate came home or something or if he suspected it. I ended up uh, recently being able to have dinner with the roommate uh, after trying to search for him since the trial ended. And um, 
I was able to say thank you. So you're you're in his car and you're heading over. Nothing's coming up along the way uh, that is standing out to you that this is uh, this is starting to feel a little bit again a little bit off. And you you arrive at his at his home. Yes. And we um, again he, he goes into the underground parking, which was significant in that he pulled his backed his van up to where the the uh, elevators are which would give him the safe uh, the the least amount of exposure if he was taking me from the apartment to the van where he would have transported me to the place where he uh dismembered which all this stuff is in is now creepy and i'm when i retell it i i just think oh my god i was lucky i was very lucky so anyway then we go upstairs he lived on the 19th floor and uh it was a very large apartment, but he kept me only in like very little part of it. I never crossed into the main, and I don't know if that again was free, it was uh, pre thought like let's keep his DNA in a very limited area. And uh, I had brought GHB, and it's at this time because I had been running late. Normally, I would have um, set it up myself, but. Because I had been running late a little bit, but texting him, I felt a little guilty because he seemed to be a very busy man. And um, so I gave him my GHB with instructions to put one of the measurements in and not two because I would go to sleep. And then just as I handed it off to him, I don't know what possessed me to say this, but I said, if you were the serial killer, this is the drug you'd want to use. And then I went off into the bathroom. And he was able to mix the drink. And I had told him to mix it with, with something like strong that's going to mask the taste because it doesn't taste very good. And um, he complied. Even serial killer recipe. I know. It's like nothing but giving, giving instructions for your own demise. Did he chuckle when you said that? Was he? What was his reaction when you said that? I don't know because I was a little self-conscious because um, he wasn't doing that. But I was. And so you kind of wonder what they're thinking. Like, oh, is this guy like a G junkie? <laughs> like that. Uh, but I just did it because it, um, I, d- I have Parkinson's and um, I tend to, sh- I shake all the time. But when, if I'm the least bit nervous, it can get quite uh, large, my shaking. And uh, the, the G always calmed it down. So I guess I did it more to sort of be in a calmer less anxious spot i'm a very anxious person to begin with but um yeah that day i was just to sort of minimize my awkwardness yeah had you uh done this before uh met up with people who you'd been messaging was this a like a common uh practice yeah but the 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 thing that i did different this day was i would never um leave my if if there were drugs involved i would never leave them out of sight of um myself because because that's the drug that they would use in a club and put drop in someone's drink like so they could yeah roofie them I and mean, i know that but it was just uh, I, it was the catholic guilt of being late and putting someone out i just felt like i had to make up t- time for him so i thought by him doing that and me uh pre- prepping in the bathroom oh, kill two birds with one stone hard, hard the pie. Yeah, I mean, it, it it all sounds relatively normal, you know, leading up to this. Uh, so he he uh, he mixed it with the drink, and you came out of the out of the bathroom, and and then what happens? Uh, okay, the, the, at this point, he takes me into his bedroom, and um, the, he closes the door, and that's the last time up until when I left that I was outside the, the bedroom. So again, very methodical in terms of not spreading my DNA around. Because you you leave a you leave a little bit of yourself everywhere, and then we started to play a little bit, and but I'm also the G is starting to do its its uh, job, and there's certain signs if you've taken too much that sort of start to happen. Uh, you start sweating profusely. Uh, I personally will see a, a, like a little bit of colored lights uh, that usually indicates that I will probably pass out at some point. Um, I think I had about maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes of, of consciousness, and then I was out. 
Now, I've been able to piece together from the timestamps of uh, the video ca the surveillance cameras how long I was there. And then from that, I was able to work out how long I was unconscious, approximately. And it, it works out to approximately 20 minutes that I was unconscious. That's when he uh, took more pictures. He had been sneaking, taking pictures of me at different times um, since I arrived there, but uh, I wasn't aware. And then I certainly wasn't aware of the picture, the infamous picture, um, which was the one that indicates me, okay, he was going to kill me because he staged my body. Because he what? He staged my body. He, he staged all his victims, usually post-mortem, but he staged my body um, in a way where, now you've got to remember, these items, I never saw them. So when I went unconscious, he brought them out. He put a hood over my head, uh, duct tape over my eyes. He handcuffed me to the bed. I never agreed to any of that. It happened while I was out. And during that time, he took uh, the the pipe that was the murder was involved in most of the murders, if not all of them, I can't remember. But he um, had it gripped in his hand, and in the picture, my head's tilted to one side, and he's pushed it, shoved it up against my neck, and he's taken a photograph. Um, that's the one that was like the uh, the moment where it was like, oh, okay, that was that's bad, <laughs> that's very bad. When did you see those pictures? I've never seen them. Um, the, the police, again, they were very, very cognizant of not causing me more trauma than I had to go through. So um, I was described that one that day. I don't think I was supposed to be given that information, but the detective sensed my um, confusion and my, my upset that I, I couldn't understand why they, they would call me a victim. So. That was the first time she described it a little bit. I didn't know about a couple of the items like the hood and duct tape. After he pled guilty, um, I left for Europe to disappear for a month. And then I came back and I had a meeting with um, Detective Dickinson, uh, the one who uh, basically cracked the case. And um, Tia from uh, the Attorney General's office, uh, Victim Services. So, the th um, And then my partner sat in on the meeting. So the four of us met. And that was probably therapeutically the first big breakthrough for me because uh, I got to, to get information that I didn't have before. Like I couldn't remember the exact date that I was there. I couldn't remember um, how I got home that day. Um, I couldn't, uh, I wanted to know, some people just don't want to know. They must stick their head in the sand like it never happened. I, in order for me to get over this, I needed every little bit of detail I could get that was possible. I still have just a little bit of the, um, the 20 minutes when I was out. But his roommate must have come home at the exact halfway point of those 20 minutes because he had time then to take the hood off, take the duct tape, put all that stuff away, and I never knew it was even there. So um, that's why when the police described the handcuffs, I was like, uh, no, that didn't happen. And so I didn't even think I had anything to add to uh, when I was going to the police uh, station. And it was them who, who uh, made me realize that uh, I was out of, there were actually four close people who um, had stepped forward that were close calls, but mine was by far the I, I went the closest and his roommate came in about halfway through uh based on your estimate about halfway through you being unconscious and you have described it in the past that he's he had you in a uh in a kill position and that is the position where he's ready to uh enact the murder uh with with his weapon of choice and his roommate steps in his roommate didn't come into the room we were in. He didn't walk into his bedroom. But what what made it, I guess, uh, noticeable was his roommate came into the apartment. So you can hear, I didn't hear this because I was unconscious, but you hear a key go in the door. And so MacArthur would have heard these things and realized, oh, I can't kill him now. I've got to like clean this up and um, make it look like nothing happened. And that's exactly what he did. So he put everything away. And the thing is, is 
if you pass out for a period of time, unless there's someone there going, oh, you, you dude, you just passed out. You were out for about 20 minutes. And I didn't even know I passed out. I just thought it was like a time blip. Like I wasn't paying, watching the clock or anything. And it was just like, uh, okay. So um, the fact that he came in at the exact moment um, where it could have gone the other way. Like I figured I was going to get my throat crushed um, that day. I'm pretty, like, I know I like I've, I've dealt with this thing and I've told people who, who do doubt it, like, okay, are you willing to put, no, I'm not going to do it. So yourself in that exact same position and not have the roommate. Are you that sure of your theory? <laughs> and you'll take the roommate equation out and then uh, see what happens. No, no way. <laughs> he was going to kill me. I'll, I'll tell you about the roommate uh, later. I did uh, find new information out just uh, about two weeks ago that it wasn't four hours early. It was actually the roommate had no intention of coming home till the Sunday. So I would have been there till the Sunday. Well, I would have been there for part of the weekend and then taken up to the other address and um, uh, laid to rest, so to speak. Wow. So you had kind of passed out and he had taken some pictures of you and sort of posed you with um, perhaps the weapon he, he would have killed you with. And uh, then the roommate came home and sort of interrupted a little bit and prevented him um, from going forward with that plan. So is that is that a ritual that he went through then? He took pictures and, and posed uh, his victims? Yeah, like um, it's in the uh, Greek statement of facts that uh, what he what he did teach victim is he would shave their um, facial hair and their their head hair, and he kept he kept that hair in Ziploc bags. That was part of the evidence. He hadn't got that far because uh, I still had my beard in my head. <laughs> um, so that was all post mortem. He used a fur coat as one of his main props in his murders. It was used in most of them. I didn't, uh, it, I had no, not seen it the day I was there, but it was all that staging was after death. And he, sometimes he put things in their mouths. Uh, he put uh, like one, at one point he had one of them in a fur hat. And I don't know the significance of all this. It was almost like he would um, do them up like a pimp, like kind of pimped out. I don't, uh, that's the look that I guess he was going for. And then he would um, sexually satisfy himself. Um, well, well, I don't know all he did to them, but uh, it's enough to uh, make me uh, start to cry in the courtroom. I'll tell you that. Especially when I was sitting that first day uh, with all the families of the people who died, and I'm sitting there without a mark on me classifying myself as a victim, I, uh, that was very um, hard pill to swallow. There must have been a tremendous amount, and there I don't know if there still is, but of survivor's guilt. Yeah, like um, that was, um, at first, uh, most of my guilt centered around Andrew because of the May um, missed date. There was a part, This is and this is all the, the, the br human brain playing tricks. And it was just like, and the what if game. Oh, what if I ha had gone that day? Then I would have been killed. And then perhaps his his appetite for, for doing this would have been satiated long enough that Andrew might not have been the next. It would have changed the, the course of events. But that is a very dangerous game when you start to play that yeah. in your head. Because it took so many minute little things to line up that I had that window of escape, that it was just sheer luck or a power greater than me looking over. He had chosen these dates because his roommate was supposed to be away for the weekend. Yeah. And that was, um, that was up until I, I just a couple of weeks ago, I always wondered, okay, he couldn't have done the whole, the whole thing of what he did to the others in four hours. So I was a little uh, con thinking that brought in a, a little seed of doubt for me, but to have uh, now know that I was going to be uh, basically 72 hours under his power, then uh, that makes more sense to me. So uh, 
it's not that I'm trying to prove anything because I, I know what happened and I know he was going to kill me. But there are some people out there. Who, there's critics in every um, walk of life. And, and my critics are very vocal on when the, my interviews get posted. Oh, man, that's ridiculous. I mean, I'm right. You got to be a critic on this. Like, what's the what's the what's the point in being a critic on this? Like, um, oh, I, I got everything like um my partner had to actually um, stop me from reading the comments because some of them were quite vicious. Like uh, um, I was cheating on my husband. So I should uh, like, I, I just, they have no sympathy for what happened. Um, one said something about he should have ripped out my nose ring while he had me tied up um, that I was stupid because I, I, I went there and I let him tie me up, which is not the truth, but that's how it, um, the conclusion they drew because the recon um, profile is is more of a uh, SM leather kind of kinky site. So because of his profi- profile and what it said, um, they just assumed I agreed to everything in his profile, which is not the, the case either. Uh, certainly not on a first meeting. Oh, I, yeah, gotcha. Well, even if you did, he's 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 still a a psychotic. He's still a serial killer. You know, like yeah, it's like they don't realize they're saying these things. But the bottom line is, so I deserve to be chopped chopped up and buried in a planter? No, Jesus. And there was there, there were the homophobes who just said that MacArthur uh, deserved a medal of honor uh, for killing oh, for for Christ's sake. And I was just like, oh, okay, I know what I'm dealing with there. So um, I only responded to one the whole time and because I was told not to go on. So I almost obeyed that fully. But, um, you know, you're curious. It's like a, an accident. You want to see what's going on. So um, I went on, and my partner was going through every negative comment, and he was defending me. And uh, there was one lady he got into a back and forth about it. And she had said something like, uh, I, I basically needed to get a new partner. And this was someone who was my rock and seeing me through this very difficult time. And so she's the one I, re- I chose to respond to. Um, and I just basically told her t- that if we're sitting in front of her and she saw I was a kind person, would she still come across as this, uh, I think I said witch, because you can't use the B word on on that site and uh and then i just told her that she should get a new partner and melt that chunk of ice that used to be her heart and to get some humanity <laughs> and then the next comment came from a christian woman which was uh, very sweet and she said people he's reading these could you please have some uh, some humanity and and uh let this man heal and i thought you go christian lady <laughs> yeah right I don't know what it is about people. Tim and I, when we started doing these podcasts, like you can, you can have the best intentions for anything, and we've never been a victim like that at all. And uh, and it's just mind blowing to read the comments, and you do get like in the beginning, you you don't understand like this is not something you should uh, take part in because you're you're essentially you know giving them what they want. You're fanning the the fire, and 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 you're you're falling to the bait, but when they start like personally attacking, you know, they're, they're attacking your partner and, you know, you just, you, you just feel like you need to respond to it again. We've never been a victim like you've been. And, and I, I, I'm, my hat's off to, uh, to you for <laughs> having that much restraint. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough cause I'm a scrapper and, um, and, uh, but I wasn't prepared for that uh, at all. Like I, I didn't think there was that much hate and, and, um, they said, well, I put myself forward by doing the interview. So I was public. Um, I was, they could criticize me all I wanted because I put myself forward. I was forced out, out to do that interview because my name was leaked to the press. I know this because my ex, uh, who lives in San Francisco was called by one of the local TV stations looking for me. I hadn't spoken to him in almost 10 years. And he uh, suddenly um, calls me and says, um, you know, City TV is looking for you. And um, I knew what it was about. I didn't have time to explain to him, but I said, I'll call you back the next day and explain it, but I have to move on this. And that's when I I brought um, 
Sean Pru into the the mix, and he uh, I basically bartered the, the fact that he could have first crack at the story because he was a journalist, but he also owned a media company, and he knew how to work it if he would handle the press from that moment to the end of trial. That was the deal I made because um, I was dealing with too much. I was At this point, I was just trying to get through every day, and I couldn't focus any energy on what the press was doing something I had to do. And then, then that's when I was advised, you need to go get in front of the story if you're going to have any control over your narrative, because otherwise they'll form a story by going around and interviewing people about you. And it wouldn't uh, be factual because a lot of assumptions are made. That was smart. I'm curious about your feelings when he pled guilty to these eight murders. Well, um, that was probably... The best day and the worst day, because um, I couldn't be happy because there's still the eight dead men. It didn't make sense to me because now I was put in a position where I didn't know what I was supposed to do because I had been preparing to be a key witness. I'd structured my whole year in terms of how I would be here in town for the last like six to nine months. Um, so I, I did some traveling at the beginning of the year. and. Um, because I was, I was trying to be out of Tor- uh, Toronto as much as possible because of the, um, it was just, the story was a Toronto story. And um, I, I wasn't going out of the house anyway. I was pretty much doing what we're told to do now. And I was already doing it for a couple of years before. I was a trendsetter. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so, by, so by isolating myself, there was no record that I'd gone through what I went through because my charges were not brought forward. The reason I was told at at the beginning was because they needed me as key witness. And uh, that would have put me in the role of a plaintiff and they didn't want that. So, and I, I was fine with that. Like if I could help put this guy away, I was, that was my, what I felt was my duty here. When he pled guilty so, okay, that, that case is closed. What about attempted murder? Like, do you not think the fact that we have a photograph of the pipe against my neck with the DNA of the two previous victims still on it and my DNA would be there as well? Like, that would be a dead giveaway that it was a, a, at least an attempted murder, if not to mention the handcuffs, unlawful confinement. Like, I didn't see much... For me, it was an open and shut case, but uh, the police, I think maybe because it, the case is so big and the investigation is still ongoing, they're, they're, they're trying to see if they can find the others out there. And uh, so it's still an open case. So um, at first I was very upset. Like uh, it was just, I felt lost. I felt like I didn't exist and I didn't know what to do because my, you got to remember this thing took up my energy and my mind 24 7 for over a year like i was having night terrors uh, almost every night and uh it, it got to be a bit much and then to suddenly be there okay well he's he's behind bars now and um we don't need your services anymore so thank you um and it was just like no record of my crime and i was just like i felt like i didn't exist no, that was a, that was probably a very very low moment for me. I think I had a breakdown that night. Yeah, I could see that. Kind of feel like uh, no one's listening to you, or your experience doesn't matter, and how close you came to death doesn't really matter legally. Yeah, there was, it was just now there it, there were some uh, documents released after about four people who had close calls and. And I, like I mentioned in there, but that's part of the investigation. Uh, so I was linked to the investigation. But at the time, it was just like uh, I discussed doing whether or not to do a victim's impact statement. And I could tell they didn't want me to make one because they, they were saying, well, it's really just for families. And uh, until uh, Catherine McDonald spoke up on her newscast and uh, she ended it by saying, and he's not even allowed to do a victim's impact statement, yet he was clearly impacted, which then led to the next morning an email saying, would you like to do a victim's impact statement? The power of the press. 
And then I went to Europe and um, the story's not that big over there. I relaxed. And by the time I came back, I, I was really compelled to meet with the police and find out all these answers. And when I got back, I was more casual about it. I was, I was feeling, okay, you know what? It had sunk in that regardless of, of record or no record, I'm lucky to be alive. Let's count our, <laughs> count our blessings there. And uh, before I was just so caught up in it, it, I needed that month to sort of like, for that reality to hit me that um, I once said to someone, uh, you know, the chances of like hooking up with a serial killer are, you have a better chance at winning the lottery. And then he go, he turned to me and he said, John, you did win the lottery. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> I got away. Absolutely. Um, yeah. When you went to court and during the trial, you saw him, right? Well, what were your thoughts when you saw him at, at trial? Um, well, I, I made sure I was in the front row that first day. Like I was just like so determined. So I got there uh, when the doors just first opened, and I stood in line for a long time. Because they had uh, extra security that day, so you had to go through a couple of checkpoints. Um, and then I was, I went in and I sat in the front row. He did not. He was led to where the um, into this little chamber thing in the middle of the courtroom where they stand or sit and listen to what's being said. And they then that's where he stood up and said guilty, guilty, guilty. And he didn't turn his head. He just stared straight ahead no remorse on his face just a, uh, he looked like a sad broken man um he didn't look like the man that i knew was bruce macarthur for me that was good that i saw him in that weakened uh state i called that day was facing my demons and and, and that was uh, able to see the weakness and the frailty and uh that helped and aside from the documentary that you're you've you've done, um, what have you done? Uh, have you done anything additional as far as um, maybe talking to other victims? Uh, what have you done in your community? Is there how has this uh, changed you to um, in a more positive light? And, uh, there's been a lot of positives that uh, have come out of this. Um, the documentary. And both my psychiatrist and my psychologist agree was the the best thing I did in terms of healing, because what the documentary allowed for was it's my wonderful life moment. Like, but instead of being taken completely out of my life and being able to watch it as an observer, as if I hadn't existed, what I was given the gift I was given is I because of the the intense circumstances, people felt compelled to approach me, Billy being one of them, um, to tell me, you know, you made such an impact on my life. I went in a positive direction. And Billy wasn't the only one. And like you, I would have never known. I hadn't seen Billy in 21 years when he uh, appeared, uh, like messaged me on Facebook. And it was just like, he would have never felt compelled to come and tell me what a difference I made. I had no idea. And for me, it was just at the time when I took him off the street, the, the, it was the right thing to do. It wasn't uh, a question of what he could do for me 21 years later, because um, it was just the right thing. It was having some humanity. And I think a lot of that is lacking. It's also given me a bit of a platform to sort of point out some to the people who are speaking the loudest. There's a lot of cr police criticism. Now, I did give an uh, affidavit at the public inquiry into police conduct uh, and how they handle missing uh, persons cases of marginalized communities. And I was able to give my truth, which was they handled me so well. They could have gone another way because I did do some very bonehead moves that day. Um, but I accepted responsibility for it. I admitted it on, on national t TV. Yeah, I made mistakes. But again, it doesn't mean I deserve to be chopped up for them. Um, yeah, definitely not. Yeah. And then um, so there's uh, some large con contingents of the um, population who are criticizing the police of their conduct in this investigation and for that i have to say i was there behind the scenes 
and they cared. They're saying they didn't care because they were gay men or they were people of color. No, they cared. They just didn't have the evidence from any of them to go. It was it wasn't until Andrew wrote the word Bruce in his in his appointment book for the day he went missing. So they had the name Bruce. They got the video footage of of Andrew, which I saw in court, of Andrew's last like getting into MacArthur's van. They couldn't make out the license plate and they couldn't make out the driver, but they were able to get the make and model. They found out that it was um, a special edition and there was like thousands of them registered in Toronto, but then they ran it with the name Bruce and they came back with five. Wow. And that was the thing that they ran those names. There was one with uh, some history with the police and that's their man. That's like the fact that they were did it, and there were other parts of the investigation where at one time it was hooked to a, a possible cannibalism ring, which w- they followed, but then they found it was unfounded, and then there was the two victims who weren't weren't even reported. And like, how can you say, oh, they're not working, um, doing their job because they didn't investigate these when they didn't even know they were missing. Like it wasn't until there was the one they put the the photo on TV, which again they were criticized for that, but they couldn't identify him. And it was it was uh, by putting it public that move, although unprecedented, um, was what got um, Mr. Cataratnam uh, identified. Yeah, wow, that is incredible. Yeah, what a story, Sean. Well, uh, I'm so so glad you're uh, you're still with us. What an experience, and so glad Billy. Uh, contacted you about doing this documentary. It seems like a very positive thing that you're uh, you're doing, um, you know, with your life now um, after this harrowing experience. When is the documentary coming out? Well, um, COVID, our little friend, um, has, has shut down everything, including the editing room is locked up, so we're we're behind schedule right now. But uh, I imagine everything's going to be behind schedule, and there's no theaters to play it in. Um, so it's just like until this this um, latest pandemic is is uh, comes to a, some sort of end, we're in limbo too with everyone else in the world. So um, I just hope that it uh, this causes me stress and anxiety, which pulls up old feelings. But it's the unknown. The unknown is what is always my enemy, and um, it's the unknown of when this is going to end. And uh, it's just causing me stress i don't like it yeah <laughs> I, everyone I, and when i start to like speak about it i think you know what it is what it is just do the best you can to get through it yeah yeah that's right just control what you can and uh and this is out of all of our controls right now but um Thank you so much for joining us here and uh, sharing your story. And, uh, and Billy, thank you so much for reaching out and, um, you know, wanting to share his story. Really appreciate it. No, seriously, my pleasure. Um, and uh, thank you, guys. It was a pleasure to meet you, uh, even though it was over the phone. But <laughs> it is the time <laughs> to live in. And uh, thank you. I just have one, one more question for Sean. Um, Dude, how do you get your beard like that? I can't. I can't <laughs> seem to do this. Well, right now it's called. You can't go to a barber to have it trimmed, and I can't trim my own um, because the Parkinson's. It just makes for a messy beard. Um, but uh, yeah, this is just. It's it's out of control right now. I, I I told you I woke up late today, so I'm basically sitting here with. It looks like roadkill stuck to my face. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>